practical, I'm going to transition now to the hands-on component of this lecture. Those not seeking to avail themselves of it are welcome to leave now. But um, uh, I will now lead you through um, some exercises getting going with uh, agent-based modeling within uh, any logic. Um, and to do that, I'm going over and switching to my any logic. And I would invite anyone else to, to do the same. If you come up with a um, with an initial page that's a welcome page, uh, you can get rid of it and, and come back to the to the main page, or you can minimize it um, and and come back to the main page. But we're going to go together, and we're going to create a a new new model. Okay, um, so I'm going to say file new model. Now, agent based modeling. I should warn people: agent based modeling. I like to, there's a Russian proverb that speaks about the knowledge of the hedgehog versus the knowledge of the fox. The knowledge of the hedgehog, um, the hedgehog knows one or two things really, really well and focuses on those things and makes its way through life um, and secures safety by knowing how to do one thing really well, like curling up. Um, uh, the knowledge of the fox is a very dated knowledge. It may be less deep in any one area, but it's wily and, and broad and makes use of a much larger set of tricks. Um, system dynamics modeling, compartmental modeling is more like the knowledge of the hedgehog. I use it deeply. You figure out these patterns that are, that are used again and again, these idioms or molecules, and, um, and you perform wonderfully deep analyses uh, with it often with a real economy of expression. Um, you don't have the chance to, um, to go into the richness of, of uh, exploration of heterogeneity and context and so on uh, that, that stands before us uh, as a possibility with agent-based model. By contrast, in agent-based model, we have um, more than knowledge of the fox. Uh, we have a broader modeling vocabulary. Uh, and it's challenging sometimes for students to learn to, to use that. But let's create a new model. And uh, here we'll have uh, uh, ABM SIR1, okay? Um, and you notice we can choose the model time units. Uh, and I'm going to be choosing days as the model time units, okay? So ABM SIR1 and days will be the time units. I'm gonna say finish here, okay? Um, and it created it. For those who didn't caught it, I did new model, and that's how we got to that set tag. So here we are. Um, a model, a fresh model sits before us. Uh, and now we have to go through the process of building it up. Building up an agent-based model involves a much larger, reflecting the knowledge of the fox, a much larger set of, of primitives. So if you go to the palette and you go to this agent tab, what you will see um, is a, uh, a set of possibilities. Uh, and they run the gamut from things evolving state charts to uh, entirely different sorts of, uh, of, of constructs. So we have parameters, for example, we have uh, events that can go off um, in two different forms. We have, uh, we have these variables um, and, uh, and functions and table functions, et cetera. And we have links to other agents. We have a larger modeling vocabulary. This is actually only a subset of it. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to learn to make use of them, but concentrate particularly much on the state chart. Um, variables become of great importance when we're dealing with continuous heterogeneity. Weight, for example, or someone's immune system strength, or someone's uh, uh, income um, that might be changing, et cetera. Um, we may avail ourselves of them in some of the later, um, uh, the later, uh, tutorials, but for now, we'll, we'll make use of, of, of this uh, 
this agent balance in terms of parameters, et cetera. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, we're going to need to uh, describe for this model to be an agent-based model, we're gonna to need to describe one or more populations of agents. Um, now, in order to do so, we need a notion, some notion of agenthood. All models are abstractions. All models simplify our, our simplifications of the world. And um, as such, we need a, to say what our simplification of the world is. What, what characteristics does an agent have? What does it mean to be an agent? To, def to define, as it were, a notion of agenthood or agentness. Um, so let's go to projects. Uh, and we're going to say new agent type. And you'll see a Da Vincian logo here, um, kind of the, the out man with outstretched arms and legs, could be a woman um, as the measure of man or woman. Um, and we'll say new agent and we'll call it person, okay? Um, uh, oops, person, not, not her done, uh, person. Okay, um, and create the agent uh, type from scratch. You'll notice there's some other questions here that are more advanced. And in fact, if you were to continue on, you'd see if you wanna give the person a little picture, but we'll learn how to do that from scratch. So it's not all magic to you. We'll say finish. And we've just added a person, okay? Um, so a different level than we've had to articulate with a compartmental model or system dynamics model an aggregate model where they're all at the same level. Now we have a notion of personhood, but that notion is yet, as of yet, singularly bereft and impoverished. So um, here we'll, we'll see there's this little area up there where there's a, um, where there's this axis of, of sorts. Um, and uh, we're going to go and put a little um, uh, indicator to, to represent the person there. Um, now, in order to do this, we're gonna make use of a different item from the palette. We'll come back to this agent one, just one that's right below it on mine, which is called presentation. We're gonna drag in an oval. Um, how did I do that? I went from projects to palette. If your palette is not visible, you can call it up from here. Um, and it will show. Um, it's possible it's somewhere else in your your screen, and you'll you'll want to deal with it wherever it it may be. Um, I'll drag it up here. These are configurable model configurable um, windows if we want to use them as such. Um, okay, so maybe I'll optimize my screen in real estate with something like that. Um, okay, um, so here we have our. Um, little uh, little oval representing a person. Um, we could have used uh, a presentation property that would have given them a, a picture of a person. This is a little bit easier to manipulate in terms of its color, color of its boundary, color of its fill, um, and we'll make use of that. There we are. Um, we've given this person a face, as it were, upon the world. And, um, but we, we've defined personhood. We haven't yet defined, um, so what it means to be a person is to have a circle. Um, that's a good start. Uh, we haven't yet defined a pro population of people. We need to do that. This is defining personhood. A theory of what it means, ladies and gentlemen, in this model, to be a person. Let's go back to Maine. Or as we say in the US, let's go down Maine. Um, in fact, it's downwind. Um, and uh, here we have uh, uh, Maine, and we will drag in, we want to create a population of people that will live in Maine. So first, well, with a bit of malice of forethought, we're going to add a parameter to Maine that's called parameter, okay? Um, how did I do that? I'm adding it to Maine. Make sure you're adding it to Maine. Um, not, not, not anywhere else. I went to the agent palette. It's actually in several of the palettes. I'm going to drag in a parameter. I'm going to call it population size. Okay. 
population size. Mm. You don't have to do this, but it, it makes the model more flexible and more nimble um, to run different scenarios. Mm. Let's make this a population size. It's a count. So it's most naturally an integer. So when I call it, we have to set its type. This is again, part of the broader vocabulary of ancient based modeling. Things can have different types, dates, times, rates, lengths. Um, I'm going to drag this up a bit. I'm going to choose an int. It's an, it's an integer, ladies and gentlemen. And its default value here, which is being asked, is going to be um, 100. Okay. And I have 100 agents by default. OK. Um, uh, does anyone uh, want to ask a, a question on on what I've done thus far, or 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 clarify me to to redo something before you um, we proceed on? Anyone? Uh, Nate, uh, it's Maurice here. Hi. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I just I missed the part about how to create an agent. Sure. Uh, so to create an agent, after the model is created, you file. Sorry, you, you do right click on this or uh, control click or whatever it is on Max, um, and then you do you do new agent type, and you would type person and say, uh, you know, say finish, okay, and and that will create the agent. Yeah. Hopefully that's that's all. Okay. Um, I, I just didn't see how you got to ABM SIR one. Oh, uh, so from the start, you do file new model. Okay. Um, and I said ABM SAR Humble. You know, okay. um, and, uh, and, and that will create that. And then you would do um, new agent type, person, and, uh, and it will create the person. And then you double click on person, you go into it. And I dragged in from the presentation palette a circle. I resized it and and put it at the origin. Um, yeah. Okay, so that, okay. that that's what I did. Um, and then I dragged in from agent palette a parameter, and I call it population size here. And I I made an int and a default value button. Hopefully that will clear up anyone else who's missed a step there. Um, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Okay, now having had having created these this person, um, uh, we could we can create a population of it. Make sure that you've placed this this oval there first, because if if you change the visual presentation, it turns out to be a little bit there's there's an extra button you need to press to tell it, hey, I changed it. Um, recreate it. Um, uh, when you're creating a, one of these populations. But um, uh, if you created that person, uh, as I showed, and you try with that presentation, you drag this in, come on, uh, drag it in, click and drag it in. Uh, it'll drag it in, you say population, boom, population. It doesn't have to make that sound, but it's always nice if it does. Um, Okay, so so I how did I do that? I, I clicked here and I dragged in and I said population. Okay, typed it. Okay, so so what is this population that lies before us? Well, it's a population of agents. Okay, and we have to tell it such that it's it could be either a single agent or a population, and we want to set it to be a population of agents, which will slightly change its appearance. So what did I do? Again, I have to find a person. I had dragged in a circle there. And then I went back to main. I went down main and I copied in a person here and I made it and I called it population. But in fact, it still says it's a single agent. To make it a genuine, true blue, honest to goodness population, I have to say population of agents. There you go. It's a population of agents. Okay. Um, Okay, um, and then it asks, it asks, how many, how many agents are there? Um, you notice by default there's a hundred. Um, and heck, we could, we could leave it 
uh, if we want to 100, later we'll come back and change it to population size. Um, um, now, believe it or not, this model is runnable. I mean, it's a runnable agent-based model. Um, to see that, you can press this button here, which is called build model. And if your model is, is specifying things clearly, if it um, what it specifies is, is clear, um, it'll say builds completed successfully down here. If your model has problems, um, it'll be unhappy and it won't say that. It will tell you where it is. So if I said, if I tried to put a space here, it'll say, oh, I'm not sure what you mean. And, and if, I, um, if, I, if I try to, um, okay, it's, it's not gonna complain there, but it's complaining here. Um, and you'll notice that, oh, it didn't even change it. Okay, yeah. So. There are certain things that it uh, it doesn't allow you to uh, to do, but um, uh, this population size uh, is something we'll come back to. Um, but it if this model is ready to run, it will it will say this here when I push that button. It's a good thing to do early. That's a good thing to do often. So I'm going to now with this model, I'm going to run it. How do I run it? I run it by right clicking on, on a scenario and then the scenario on which I want to run and I'll say run. And I'll run it and lo and behold, there's not much to look at, but a, a circle. In fact, that's a hundred circles on top of each other. Let's go make them less crowded as it were, particularly in this age, COVID-19. These are all on top of each other. But let's just, to, to prove that, I'm gonna go over here. I'm teaching, of course, the interface while we're talking this. I'm gonna create this, there's this little toggle developer panel. And that is the ticket for model exploration. So I'm gonna to toggle it. I can, you know, make it open or close. I'm gonna make it open here. And what you're gonna see is um, that you can go, excuse me, it's this one here. I can actually go call down and I could say, oh, there's a population of size 100 there. And I can actually go explore each population member. But they're all right now kind of boringly similar. There they are. They're all just sitting there, like bumps on a log, um, uh, just with the same appearance, um, same stature, et cetera. So I could go through each person in the population, but I'm not going to do that. It's, um, we have more interesting things to pursue. But I will stop this model. Um, I'm gonna stop it, I'm gonna close this window, which will stop this simulation. Great, okay. Um, so let's, let's give them a face upon a world that's a little bit more variegated as it were. Let's give them a, a different um, appearance. Um, let's give them a, a different location. Okay. Um, now, there's several ways of, of doing this, um, it turns out. One way is if you click on this population, um, you can set it down here to have a certain location. So you could click there and you can say, okay, where do I place the agent? Um, uh, and you could say at a specified point. I want to put them at a at a specified point. So maybe I'll, just to show this to you, um, I'm gonna give a formula here that will compute. What's their X coordinate, okay? Um, and um, I'm going to say, draw from a uniform distribution mm. um, between location X location zero, and I'll say X location 400. We're gonna just gonna hard code that 0, 0.0 and 400.0. Okay. It's kind of good to be to use those dot zero to prevent some silly errors later. If you get in the habit of using them, you'll avoid yourself some silly errors. So here we're saying, hey, um, well, Y and Z are zero, but X is drawn from you know, from a uniform distribution between zero and 400. You have equal likelihood of being in any little 10, 10 length period within that. Um, uh, so 
here we go. We're going to say run. How, oh, you can build. Let's go build. Um, build successfully. Happy camper. Um, and I'm going to run it here. Okay, I'm going to right click and say run. Here we go. Um, and there you see a bunch of agents laid out a raid before us. Um, uh, and uh, that that um, array uh, of, of agents um, is illustrating the fact that each agent draws independently from this distribution. Each of these people in the population is using this to, to generate a random number, to, 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 it's drawing it from this distribution. Um, but it's it's all hard coded as to to what this limit is. Let's let's change that. I'm gonna I'm gonna change this to be instead of 400. I'm gonna say now I'm gonna introduce a little bit of notation for you. Um, this dot space width. Okay. Um, uh, and I will put it up on a big screen so. If you're like me and your eyes are are um, tired by the day, but also added addled by age, you will uh, perhaps appreciate a larger rendition of it. So, oh come on, um, I want a, an editor where I can make it nice and big. Forgive me for just a second. I picked up the wrong wrong editor here on Linux. Uh, I'll do it with Kate. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, come on. Um, there we go. Um, so this is what I put in there. Um, I'm saying, hey, call this thing space width, which returns a number. Maybe it's 400, maybe it's 1,000. Um, and I'm saying, call it on on this. And, and, and this is Maine. I, I'm in Maine. And so it's saying, Call it on me. Call it on me. Um, uh, and uh, I'm going to say, hey, uh, uh, call that. I'm going to determine a number. Maybe it's 400. Maybe it's 800. And I'll use that as as this the the, the second thing here to for uniform. Um, I'll use that as the second so-called argument. The second value uniform needs to do its job. Um, so uniform is going to draw. A random number between zero and whatever space width return. And these begin paren m paren is just telling it it doesn't need anything to do its job. And so you give it you give it nothing. Um, uniform needs two numbers to do its job. Those are those those two. It's just like in high school trigonometry, we used to write, you know, sine of 90 degrees or what have you. Um, these are we're making similar calls here. Okay, so that's what I put there. Um, and I'm going to run that, and uh, you'll see, okay, it determined a, that that was kind of the, the natural space width to use. And you'll notice that it reflects this, this kind of um, boundary that's uh, around here, this frame, which we can extend um, here. If we wanted, we could make its width larger. Um, and um, that would change that, okay? Uh, but we've only set the X location and those, those circles are looking rather crowded. And if we're simulating infectious diseases that may, um, that may portent adverse outcomes. So I'm gonna put in a similar formula and I'll copy and paste uh, for Y, but instead of saying space width, I'll say space height. And you'll find there's another. Now, you'll notice that I, I cheated a little bit. I, I didn't type this out from memory. I actually went and in any logic, if you're typing, there's a lot of context where you can press variously, depending on whether you're on a PC or Mac, control space, or what I think maybe command space um, on a Mac. Um, but it will say like, uh, It'll give you all the things by which you could complete what you're typing, uh, or that include this spaces and get agent space type, etc. Um, but one of the things is this thing space height, 
Um, and that's what I want. So, hey, come on, space height. Um, uh, this is the one. And I'm going to sort of um, put my list down there and, and let it complete it. OK. Um, so this is just getting agents lined up in terms of their location, space width and space height. Um, so for Y location, it's going to be determined between zero and the space height that's going down. X location, we do zero and the space width that's going horizontal. And I'll say run. Uh, I should have probably said, you know, build it. But here we are. Here we have our agents spread out over over their um, over their their the space. Okay. Um, so um, that's nice. That's good. We have a bit of heterogeneity. Um, we could assign each agent uh, lots of characteristics. We could assign them a self-identified gender. We could assign them a biological sex. We could assign them a, um, whether they're a citizen or not, or, or what have you, or if they're a resident of Canada or not. And we can do all those things uh, quite readily. Uh, we could have a continuous characteristic, um, their height or their weight, um, uh, or we could have a discrete characteristic, uh, you know, associated with their um, um, the number of living um, nuclear family members or what have you. In any case, um, here we have uh, some heterogene heterogeneous agents, um, heterogeneous agents. Um, okay, any questions on what I've done before we get into adding some dynamics uh, for these? Oh. Well, one, let's complete the thought. Population size is as of yet disconnected from this thing called population size. And to dignify this, let's go for population, set it to be of size, population size. How do we do that? Click on population. And for the initial number of agents, we say this dot population size. There we go. This dot population size my population size, this, this is in Maine, my population size. Earlier we said this dot space width, my space width, Maine's width and Maine's height was what this, so this dot, you could think of the dot almost as an apostrophe, it's mine, um, um, population size of me. Um, uh, and that's this one, this parameter, okay? It's my population size. Um, secret is you actually don't need that here, but it's a good thing for students to start thinking about because there's one or two places where if, if you put it reflexively, you'll avoid problems. But if you don't put it, you'll get confused and you may make an obvious error. And that's not a good thing. Um, in my book. Okay, so um, so this build, you can build it here and you'll be, um, should be okay. And now we have this link to population size. So this simulation uses the default value of this parameter, which was 100. And so it has by default population size. But if we want a big population size, we can go right click on this, on the project. When you want to add a new thing to the project, like an agent type, you could do it by by right clicking, you can add an option list, an experiment, lots of different things. We'll say uh, experiment, boom. And we'll say big population, big population. How did I do that? I right clicked on this. I said new experiment. And then I type big, big population. And I press finish. And it created an experiment. Experiment depicts, these experiments depict scenarios. They're going to run your model with certain, uh, certain assumptions. Um, each of these scenarios is going to state, in fact, communicate certain assumptions um, uh, to, uh, to this model. I see that there's a, a chat message here, but unfortunately, uh, thank you, Mac, option and space. Thank you, I, I'm, I'm Mac impaired. So thank you uh, very much, uh, much appreciated. Um, okay, um, 
So ladies and gentlemen, for big population, we'll set a population size of 1,000. What this is specifying is what population, what's the value of a parameter? A parameter uh, allows you to specify and communicate an assumption. If you declare a parameter a certain place in a model, it serves as a vehicle for, for setting and communicating to this thing um, what assumption to make about it from the point of creation of it. So for Maine, it's created by, a, by an experiment or scenario. And so that's where you specify the value of the parameter. Soon enough, we'll have within persons uh, parameters that apply to that particular person like their self-reported gender or what have you. And, um, and we'll communicate that from the population which creates those persons. Um, but for main, the value of a parameter main is specified by experiment um, uh, associated with the model. So it's here, we'll, we'll specify a population size of thousand. There we go, okay. Um, and let's run it here. Um, big population and there we go we have more agents now and if you go over and click on this you'll find oh my population is a thousand people and you could iterate through them for much of the evening um okay um so that's that's uh, interesting um uh you know we could lend each each agent here a lot more richness as i said um we could lend it uh, variability and in, in parameters um uh so here um uh maybe we'll we'll lend it a um a, a biological sex um for example um, we'll, we'll lend some heterogeneity Heterogeneity is extremely important um, with an agent-based model. And it's one of the areas that agent-based models excel. Uh, if you have a lot of heterogeneity to represent, doing so in a compartmental model, system dynamics, an aggregate model is extremely painful. Um, you have many dimensions of heterogeneity and it becomes a, a bookkeeping exercise that is that gets really awkward and, and, and is, um, it feels very unnatural. Um, uh, doing so at an individual level within agents is a, it's just no problem at all. You, if you wanna, if you wanna have one more dimension now of heterogeneity, uh, in terms of nimbleness, if you wanna be able to say, why don't we look at heterogeneity and income within an aggregate model? Gosh, you have to go across the entire model and stratify it by income. Add that to the set of things, the set of dimensions. It's a global change to the model that it requires you to change lots and lots and lots of things. With an HMS model, you just go plop down an additional attribute of heterogeneity, and similarly, you can remove them. If your learning suggests you no longer want to keep it. That's that's a, an asset for nimbleness. Um, and you know, as we learn about a infection, um, and as we enrich our model, often we do want to capture new types of distinction or change how we characterize it. It's a lot easier in an agent-based model, an individual-based model. So let's get a person and let's let's give them a, a sex, um, okay? Let's, let's give them a biological sex. Now, to do this with finesse, um, and to do it with clarity, it's nice if we can be very clear about our, our, our stated um, division uh, that, into which we, we wanted to divide it. So I'm gonna add what's called an option list. This is another, the knowledge of the fox, um, this, this broader modeling alphabet of any logic uh, and, and of agent-based modeling in general. So right click over here on the, the project and say new, and you're gonna say option list here. And the option list will be um, called sex, okay? Um, 
And we're going to add two things here. We're going to add male and female. Okay. Um, if I had had presence of mind, I would have had female first. Um, but um, uh, we have male and female for the sex. Um, I like to capitalize them. But um, uh, so how did I do that? Let me rehearse that again if anyone missed it. New. I right click on the project because I want to add it to the project. Let's say new option list. And I want to call it sex. And I want to add, I'll call it female this time, and first and, and male second. Um, okay. Um, and I'll say finish. Boom. Now I have this distinction between men and women or males and females in the population. In, 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 or I don't actually, it's not yet in the population. This distinction between males and females, sort of ontologically. Um, now I want to make a distinction that applies to each person. To lend a person an attribute that doesn't change over time, as we won't have their biological sex change over time here, we use a parameter. You may remember that from my slides. Um, parameters distinguish um, characteristics that don't change over time. Um, so, so how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to go to person. It's person that has the parameter. The theory of personhood needs to be elaborated with this parameter. So how are we going to do that? We're going to double click on person, show person in the canvas. We're going to modify our theory of personhood, a theory of what it means to be a person, a personness. OK, in the palette, under the agent type, there's a thing called parameter, drag it in, boom. And we're going to call it this particular person, sex, lowercase, lowercase. Mm. They're going to have a particular sex, this particular person. Mm. It's going to be their particular characteristic. And what type will it be? Does anyone want to hazard a guess? What will the type be? What, what set of possible values could this hold? Um, something of that's called their sex could hold values taken from where? Anyone? We added it, not five minutes dense. A string? Yeah, from this, uh, actually, it's from this option list we just added, their sex. We, we named it that for a reason. So if you go down, you'll find sex here. So we've added a new distinction to the model, sex. Um, and and so this will have sex, have a, have a distinction called sex, uh, rather different. And um, its default value will be, um, well, we, we won't, let's suppose we won't specify a value. I'll, we can come back to that later, but I, I won't elaborate that right now. Um, great, so each person can now be distinguished by, by sex, okay? Um, they'll be distinguished by their, um, by their characteristics. I think if I say male here um, or female here, I think it will actually, uh, it may actually use that, but yes, it will. So we could just say female, sure. Um, okay, so each person, our theory of personhood has been elaborated to allow us to distinguish people by sex. Great, okay, um, so it's kind of nice, um, but, now we want each person in the population to have a different sex. Um, so we can have different people have different sexes. How are we gonna do that? Well, let's go to main. Mm. And we'll go to population. In order to specify the characteristics, we go to the population of those people. Um, this is a particular population of people and they'll have a certain sex distribution. Mm. Mm. Now, there's two ways we could we could do this. Um, uh, so, or there's many ways we could do this. Um, we could pull it from a database, um, and you could see you could say load from a database, for example. Um, we could flip a coin, um, uh, and I'm going to show you a way that's a little bit more. Uh, it's quite nice. It's quite practical. Um, it's quite common. And uh, 
and requires really virtually no no programming here. Um, so let's uh, let's go to the palette in the agent palette, and let's go or look at main, and we're going to go drag in what's called a a, a custom distribution here. Okay, there we go, custom distribution. Okay. Um, and uh, that custom distribution, um, uh, so we're going to set it to be um, sex distribution, okay? Um, and the sex dis distribution, uh, distribution, there we go. Um, and, uh, okay. Um, Great. Uh, and this sex distribution will have a type uh, options um, drawn from our optionless sex. So we're going to have a certain possibility of being male and a certain possibility of being female. Maybe this is a population where 52% are female and 48% um, are male. And I'll, I'll put it down there. Um, we can alternatively load it in from a database. So what did I just do? I've basically allowed for you to set a distribution. In this case, it's a bit contrived, but uh, for a general population, because it's going to be very close to, to, to parity. But you could do this by immigration status. You could do it by age or by income level or what have you. So this custom distribution. Mm. Um, and we're going to be able to draw values from this custom distribution to set the sex of particular members. Okay, let's go to population. Um, so population is a population. It'll state for each member of that population, what is their, what should we assume about their characteristics and specifically about their parameters. For each parameter within person, the population of persons is going to have to make an assumption about that parameter value. Um, okay, so for population here, we're going to set, and notice when we look at population, there's a thing sex. Uh, so this is to set state their sex. Okay, um, we're going to. And this, we fill this in with a formula, with a formula to use for each for each person. Um, you notice it's giving us some hints. We can look up what number of person is this in the population, for example. But we're going to say, we're going to call the sex distribution um, and it's going to return a value, okay? So, so we're just saying, hey, draw it from this distribution. Um, just like before, we said, you know, uniform um, between zero and 400 or whatever we did, 0, 0.0 and 400.0. Here, we're going to just say, hey, draw it from the sex distribution. Okay. And if we do that, it will, each time it will draw a value from that distribution, or the probability of drawing each is given by this. There we go. Okay. There we go. Sex distribution. There we go. Okay. Um, so press this to build the model. There we go. Um, okay. Um, mine says build completed successfully. So I'm going to go and whether in the regular size population or the big population or what have you, I can run it. And you'll say, well, looks the same as before. And it's true. Um, Let's go over here though. Hmm. And we'll open this up, but we can go and explore the population members. And what we'll see is here's a male in the population. Here's a female, here's a male, here's a female. They all differ actually by sex, okay? Um, they're differing by sex and that's notable. Um, we have a heterogeneous population. Um, this didn't require model modification everywhere in the, in, in the model. We had to add this characteristic here. And we needed to 
you know, specify what that sex was. We added this distribution to do it. But generally speaking, adding heterogeneity to an age-based model or removing it or changing it is a, is a fairly nimble affair compared to in compartmental model, where, you know, you have to say, oh, man, if we have to distinguish men from women in the population, we have to create two copies of the susceptible state variable or stock or compartment, whatever you want to call it or two copies of the I, two copies of the R. We have to set up a mixing matrix parameterized by the number of distinctions, by the number of distinctions, blah, blah, blah. Here, it's a fairly surgical matter. Okay, but let's, let's have their appearance be based on their sex. Mm -hmm. um, great. Um, how are we going to do this? Well, um, if you go click on that that uh, icon here, um, uh, we'll, we'll find that actually it has an appearance. Hmm. Click on that icon, we're in person. Very important to, to note where are you at. This is Maine up here. This is setting the global situation, the, the, the stage in which the agents struck. This is setting the the overall context globally. Um, it may have multiple populations in general. Person is setting the theory of personhood. And, and what we're describing is the color with which we will color someone is, is part of their the theory of personhood. So by clicking on this oval, um, we can set this part of the theory of personhood. So right now you'll notice the fill color is white. We could change this uh, as we see fit um, uh, by by changing this. And you know, if I turn it, set it to magenta, and I were to go run it um, here, they'd all turn magenta. Okay, that's kind of nice. But we want to set it by their sex. Uh, we want it to be different by sex. How are we going to do this? Well, you notice there's this little equal sign. You can pull that down and say a dynamic variable. Make it a dynamic variable. In other words, it'll vary, it'll change. Um, and we can give a formula for it. Um, so what we're gonna do is give a formula based on sex that will determine its color. Okay. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit of syntax for doing this. Um, because secretly folks have been programming in Java here. You don't know what, but I'm gonna give you a bit of syntax from Java. So what I'm going to say is, if sex equals, double equals, not just one equals, two equals, meaning it's, we're not assigning to sex, that's what that would be, but we're testing, is it, is it female? This is like an if statement. Is it female? Question mark. If so, we'll set it to be yellow okay um i'll set it to be yellow otherwise well sure green yellow sure uh otherwise that's the else that's the colon gray okay um uh and and there we go Gray. um okay um <laughs> green yellow <laughs> gosh uh sorry gray um is it is it Gray, uh, it is. Oh my gosh! I always thought gray spelled that way was like um, the family, but um, <laughs> I guess I could use Earl Gray and Gray Poupon. Um, but uh, this is uh, G R A Y instead of E Y. I I stand corrected. Um, um, okay. So uh, what did that? What is that? Well, if if this is a site for Poor sight for tired eyes. This is what it is. Um, um, put it on the big screen. Um, if sex is female, uh, then use gray yellow. Otherwise, use gray. And this is kind of an indicator. Else, this is kind of, is it that? Um, you know, then use this. I said green yellow. Um, I'm, I'm glad to use other colors. I just didn't want to play into stereotypes here. Um, so uh, you can choose whatever colors uh, befits you. Um, 
And there we go. There we have. Uh, who are the green yellow? Can anyone say who are the green yellows here? Anyone? They are the what? They'd be the females. They'll be the females. Yeah. And the other, the gray, are, are the males. So if we were to go look at this with this panel here, and you go look here, um, you can go look at the population, and you can go through each member, and there's there's the first member who happens to be male, and hence they're gray. Um, female, green, yellow. Um, male, gray. Um, another male, gray. Uh, female, etc. Um, so they're colored accordingly. Um, now, I'm trying to teach you some principles woven in with the kind of mechanics of this. Heterogeneity is extremely important um, uh, in many areas of infectious disease modeling. Spatial heterogeneity, network heterogeneity, um, heterogeneity in terms of characteristics and vulnerabilities. Um, Agent-based modeling shines when it comes to to heterogeneity. Um, it's uh, it's one of its natural areas of of strength, um, and it's it's a natural area of strength because it's very scalable with heterogeneity. Um, you can add many types, um, and you can add them in a nimble way without needing to modify the model very very broadly. It's more surgical. Um, uh, we've also seen a principle that within any logic has a in agent-based modeling in general, it tends to have this object-oriented philosophy. We modify things sort of, uh, we, we describe things in a way where we have, um, you know, the agent takes care of things related to agents. Uh, main takes care of things related to the overall situation. Um, we, we encapsulate what's going on in an agent within the agent, taking care of their behavior and taking care of their um, characteristics and their appearance here. And you, you could see where this is going with some of these connections here that are that are built in. Okay, so we've we've done a certain amount. We've added heterogeneity. We could add an income. Maybe that would be continuous. You could add a distribution of a continuous variable using a custom distribution in name. Um, and you would just specify income as a parameter and specify an assumption for here, maybe draw it from a distribution. You could read it from a database. You could go and and um, generate it by some formula, what have you. Um, this is all nice, um, but we're in a dynamic modeling class. And, you know, a, a class which is teaching age-based modeling here for dynamic modeling and for infectious disease modeling. And, and really we haven't been doing that. Um, uh, we haven't added behavior here. So let's go ahead and add behavior. I noted that agents are kind of actors that are autonomous and, and we wanna add some meaningful autonomy here, some behavior that they can shape. Um, so that'll be part of our theory of personhood and, and it befits us to phrase that theory of personhood um, in, in the person class. So if we've got a person here, um, we'll, uh, up in person, um, we're going to describe the behavior of our time and how that changes. So to do that, we're going to use one of the most basic constructs, two wit, um, a state chart. And to, to help you um, appreciate state charts um, in the sense of understanding, not in the sense of liking necessarily, um, I want to distinguish them from um, from what we see in compartmental model. Um, by the way, this slide bears out this issue that when we're engaged in compartmental modeling, we stratify models to capture heterogeneity. We we have susceptible males and susceptible females, exposed males, exposed females, infective males, infected females, and we have different flows between them defined at each level. We have cumulative incidents for each, etc. And, and we said that in agent-based modeling, it's quite different. We, we let the responsibility of having that heterogeneity lie in the, say, in the agent. Um, but there's another thing I wanna communicate with this slide. Hmm. Um, 
when we have a stock and flow model like this, um, we we use it to to depict the possible states. Um, you know the, what what composes the state of the system. We have a set of susceptibles, exposed, infectives, and recovered. Um, but we also use it to specify at once the rules of changing those states, such as via these flows. We further use it to, and by implication, state under what conditions those rules apply, which is here all the time. They apply. It's a continuous, continuous integration of it. Um, by contrast, state charts. Um, well, if I can flip back to state charts here, state charts um, characterize a given state chart with respect to a given type of concern. Specify similar things. Um, a set of possible states with respect to that concern. The the um, rules or the actions that change those states in, in compartmental models with those flows between them um, that change the state. Here are the things that change the state are, are these transitions going between one state and another with respect to, to this concern. And finally, we have, and you can see the icon types. There's this whole iconography. Um, um, which indicates different types of rules by which these actions are fired. Um, this indicates a timeout. After a certain amount of time, exactly, they will leave the infected state and go to the recovered state. Um, that may time may differ by individual, or it may be a fixed overall constant, but they will leave here and go to this after exactly that amount of time. Um, Others are a, a hazard rate, a chance per unit time of leaving this going to this, temporal probability density for those who feel more comfortable with that um, terminology. So this is a, a chance say per day that they'll, they'll lose immunity and so their immunity will wane and they'll go back to susceptible state. Some others yet are, are contingent on receiving a message. These are asynchronous. Um, say one in each and, and it exposes another one and says, you, you are, are exposed to infection here. Um, this is how they interact within an agent-based model. And from this very seat, not an hour thence, I, I noted for you that in an agent-based model, the, the um, philosophy prizes characterizing how Overall dynamics um, come from interactions of agents, and, and this is a hallmark of interaction. One agent's change of state is contingent upon actions of another agent, or sometimes another state chart within the same agent, and it's asynchronous. It'll come at, at some time and say, oh, well, I've got a letter, I got a message, and I'm going to change state. Um, it's called a message transition. Um, uh, there are others too. There's one for arrival when you're traveling, you're traveling and traveling, and then you arrive at your destination and it kind of wakes you up and you go into a different state, for example. Um, there's a condition transition when your condition changes, maybe and you get sufficiently sick, you're at risk of dying, and, and you die if your viral load level goes above a certain threshold, for example. So there are these different types of transitions that, that are the rules that govern these actions by which state is changed. So a state chart at once specifies possible states, the actions that can change them, where you, what state you can go from from one to another, and the rules by which those are governed. Um, uh, so we're going to go build a state chart, and we're going to have infection be transmitted on it. So let us steal ourselves to that task and proceed forthwith. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to go to any logic here, and we're going to be in person because we're describing an elaboration, no less, of our theory of personhood. Um, uh, there we go. Um, and uh, and so I scrolled up a little bit. There we go. Okay. Uh, Great. Um, so we're going to go 
try again from the palette, a state chart entry point. And I'm going to call it responsive to the fact we may have more than one concern for this agent infection state chart. Okay. Um, we could call if we wanted to COVID infection state chart. Um, you notice they put it all in one words in this convention called camel case. Um, any logic, and indeed, uh, because underlying Java won't be happy if you put a space. It'll say, it's oh, a valid Java identifier. You could put an underbar if that makes you like it better. Um, I prefer camel case, um, but uh, you can, um, you, you do have the flexibility and some people like to put under bars on um, instead where instead of uh, a space. Okay, here we go. Um, uh, so infection state chart. Um, and, uh, oh, uh, okay. Uh, um, oh, that's interesting, I'm seeing this. The option list will not allow multiple entries on Mac. Um, that's, uh, Curious, there may be another way to, to enter it there on Mac because we've we've done many exercises of this sort, and I haven't heard that before. And I know many of my students use Mac, so I'd be surprised if there's not a way. It may maybe a slightly different way. Okay, so here's our infection state chart. Um, and uh, what I'd like to do now is to copy a state here, and we're going to have them start in a susceptible state. Um, you'll notice I'm starting everyone susceptible right now. They they come in and um, I didn't quite center it. Um, these two are connected together. And you can tell that by noting that this is green there. Green is the color to indicate a valid connection. So if you move one around, the kind of move move around by much, um, or at least to a to a fair degree. Okay. Um, uh, if you want to disconnect them, you can do so. Uh, if they're not quite connected, it will be white and you can kind of drag it in here. In general, when you have connectors, you can uh, double click on them and, and move them around. Um, we won't do that for this one, but for others, we may see that. Okay, so we have susceptible, great. Um, the, the length of the, and their exact location where they hit is not material. So we'll have susceptible, and then we'll have uh, exposed, um, um, an exposed state. Um, and uh, for now, we're going to have the um, there be a connection between these. Um, so we're going to put in a transition from uh, susceptible to exposed. If you want, you could spare yourself a little work by going in, pitching it up at one end or another. You'll know, have to work to drag it, drag it along. I'm doing that. Boom. Um, and in general, as I said, you can click and sort of stretch it as you see fit for your aesthetics. You can also click to remove the blibbit. Um, so uh, there we go. Um, I think Maurice amongst us is old enough to remember the Microsoft limit. Um, but uh, uh, this is a transition, and right now it's a timeout transition. Okay. Um, now, um, I am going to um, uh, to want to illustrate um, the operation of this. Um, so it turns out this is a runnable model. Um, and you'll notice we set it to have a timeout of, of one. Maybe we'll set it to be a timeout of, of 10 here. Okay, I'm gonna go. You'll notice it's a little clock icon and um and we'll set it to a timeout of 10 time units. The time unit for the model that we set originally, go click here, we set it to be days. Um, and by 10, that 10 means dates. Um, uh, you can actually be more explicit about it. You can say 10 times days, um, but I, I won't get into that right now. You can be explicit about your units, which is rather nice. Um, but so they're gonna come in here. 
be here for a little bit and then they're going to leave. Okay. Um, so let's go um, run the model. Let's go here. I'm going to build it. There we go. Built it. And I'm going to say run the simulation. Great. Um, and well, we can't see any actions, but uh, if we go click here and we go look at them, there they are. Oh my gosh, they just changed. It's time 12 now. But now everyone's in this other state. Um, no matter what sex they are, they're in that other state. Okay. Um, so I don't know if you caught that, but um, uh, you can start to run it. And I'm going to slow this model down. Um, I'm going to press this and it will go slow as molasses here. Okay. Um, um, I'm pressing this little time control. And you can see it's it's proceeding along in a stately determined pace, but uh, it's not yet close to 10 days. Um, I'm going to pull down this. And here we can see people are all in the susceptible state. Boom, 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 boom. Um, and then if I speed it up and time proceeds more quickly and, and things rush by and empires rise and fall, um, we, uh, uh, we're, we're proceeding and watch this. Oh, they went and got exposed because 10 days after they came in here, uh, they went to the exposed state. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, we've articulated a bit of dynamics. There's a bit of dynamics here. I'd like it to be a bit more visible. Um, and for this, I'm going to, again, refer back to this poor uh, off-slighted um, um, uh, little uh, icon, circle icon. I'm going to go back to the theory of personhood and elaborate this a bit. I'm clicking on that icon. I'm going to set its border color by their infection status. So how am I going to do this? Click on that icon. I'm going to say, oh gosh, um, the line width here, I'm going to pick it to be a, a nice, a nice fulsome width. Um, so I click there, go to the appearance, go pick line width, and I set it to be four points. There you go. And there it is. It sits before us uh, with a nice fat border. Um, OK. Um, a thick border whose color we will change at our will to, to, to indicate visually their infection status. And how will we do that? Well, um, we're going to set up a, a variable to indicate their the, 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 the color we want that to, to show. Mm. Um, how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to add in a variable from this very palette down here under the agent. We're going to add in a variable. There we go. And the variable will be called reflective of the fact that we are a Canadian group and uh, um, with a colleague from um, UK attending, um, someone perhaps from China, but attending remotely. Um, uh, who's affiliated with Canada, we're going to call it color with a appropriate O-U-R, okay? Um, uh, in the Queen's, in, in accordance with the Queen's, Queen's English. Um, uh, and this, the type of this is going to not be one of these built, oh, no, it is, they've added it. Okay, color, uh, C-O-L, and that is dictated the type of this it's not an int it's not a character it's not a string it's not a boolean it's not a yes or no it's it's not instead it's a it's a color spelled according to the dictates none other than the american imperium so uh we're going to call it a uh, color here okay um and its initial value ladies and gentlemen will be black um there we go um uh black so i'm gonna have it be black mm -hmm. um and well you know it, right now it's it showed kind of black naturally so maybe, maybe we'll say i'll make it uh 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 no, i'll make it blue okay there we go i'm gonna call it blue 
So this, this variable, its job in life is to keep track of their current color. Um, and it'll be changing over time. It's an aspect of their state. I'm gonna start at blue. And we're gonna set this little oval to have its, have its color of this uh, be, uh, be blue. Oh, okay. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, right. Uh, I, I wanted to, to have this right. So we're gonna, um, we'll do it with color. See, it says line color here. I'd like you to choose dynamic variable and say this dot color, okay? So it'll use whatever my color is, the value of this variable called color within me, me being the person here, my color, my color. Um, it'll use it to set the value of this, um, of this border. My color right now is just blue. And so for now, um, this is gonna be set to, to blue. So let's go run that. Boom. I'm gonna go run it and we should see a bunch of circles surrounded by blue, um, navy blue. Um, okay. Uh, and we're close. We're tantalizingly close to, to finishing the job. Because now, having a variable there, we can set it. And we can set it according to their what? Can anyone guess where my mind is going? We'll set it according to their... The answer is their state. Um, we'll set it according to their state. And someone said state. Yes, exactly. So when they got a susceptible, we will sign color to be green. Color equals green. And here's the thing. We need a semicolon. I'm sorry to probably work, but you'll get yourself in trouble later if you you know, put it in now. So put a semicolon. It's kind of like an exclamation point. It kind of like says, do this. It's a command. It's a statement. It says, do this. Um, it's an imperative. Do it. Um, so color equals green. Remember, two equals meant test whether it is, you know, uh, male or whatever. But it says setting color to be green. And here exposed, we will set it to be yellow. Yellow. There we go. Um, um, yeah, yeah. Um, fine. Um, set it to be yellow. Great. Okay. Um, and now, by virtue of having done that, if we run it, um, by the way, we need a semicolon for that too, because we're saying do this. Go, go. Let's get it. It's a statement. It's, it's telling it command to do something, change something. And so we need the, the semicolon. Um, we have a tyranny of semicolons. Um, uh, and uh, unfortunately, any logic forces you to live with cancer of the semicolon. Um, okay, so people are starting green and then suddenly they all change to yellow. And you can see the semantics. Part of my, my reason for doing this is you can see the semantics of this timeout transition. Um, it, you could see how it how it changes all at once. Um, uh, okay, so um, people are trying to reach me about unknown matters. Um, uh, okay, so you'll notice they all changed at once because this is a fixed timeout. Um, it's a fixed amount after they came into the susceptible state, they will leave via this transition. And how long is it? It's ten days. Um, so when they come in, um, they, they're there for a certain amount of time, time marches on, and at 10 days, boom, they all change. Let's go change that to be a, a rate transition, as it were. Um, so we'll set this instead to be a rate, and we'll keep the mean time that they're in this state to be 10 days. Um, what would the rate constant be 
to keep it there for 10 days on average. Can anyone guess? What's the rate constant to keep them here for 10 days? This is a, a memoryless transition process. This is the, the, the rate is the chance per unit time that they'll leave. It's uh, the time in the state is exponentially distributed. Um, I'm, I'm telling you in different ways, but the mean residence time is one over the rate. The mean residence time is 10, the rate is 0.1, and then so I use 0.1. Okay, so we just set it to be a rate. Let's go build, boom. And now let's go run. Hmm. There we go. Um, okay, and you'll notice that, that people are changing to expose at arbitrary, at, at you know, various random times, right? Some changing sooner and some changing later. Um, reflective of this new semantics that this transition is stochastic. Um, we have a stochastic transition, okay? Um, okay, um, and that's all nice, but, you know, we haven't taken into account the, the defining feature of a communicable disease epidemiology, that my transition is contingent upon the the, the state of people around me. Um, my state depends on yours. Um, uh, here we have some stochastics going on. We have some evolution going on of a person. We have some heterogeneity going on of a person, all of which are, are you know, notable features in uh, agent-based modeling. But we don't have any coupling going on between people that, that is the hallmark of nonlinearity, et cetera. Um, so let's add this before this session is out. We will. Okay, so um, uh, let, us, let us now bend ourselves, ladies and gentlemen, to that task. Okay, um, we're gonna take on that challenge in a couple of ways. Um, and uh, I'm gonna move fast and live light on the land here because we have limited time and I have, uh, uh, it seems three urgent deadlines to attend to this very evening after this. So um, let's um, uh, let's go um, add a few features that will flesh this out as an infectious disease model. And next time we'll come back and, and we'll clean things up. We'll have some nice output showing the number of infectives over time. We'll um, have some histograms showing number of people with different numbers of connections and, and a, a set of other niceties. Um, but let's uh, cut to the chase. Number one, I'm going to impose a network on people. Let's see how I do that. So let's go to Maine. And once again, we go down Maine. Okay, um, click on Maine. If we scroll down, we'll see there's an area called space and network. <clears throat> Indeed. In the space and network area, I'm going to say we're going to impose a network type of a certain sort. Do we want it to be scale free? Do we want it to be small world? Do we want it to be ring lattice where people are arranged in a purely local 1D fashion? Do you want it to be distance based, like based on distance between people, or do we want people connected um, in a in a way uh, willy nilly? So any two pairs of people has equal probability of being connected, a so-called Poisson random or Bernoulli random or Erdos random network. Um, we're gonna choose a distance-based network. Um, and I'm going to specify a distance-based range of 75 here, ladies and gentlemen, 75. Um, so I chose a distance-based network connection range of 75. Um, Two people be connected if and only if they live within 75 units uh, of, of space. Um, and each of these little squares is 10. Okay, tiny little, little squares. Um, okay. Um, so that's nice. Uh, we want them to display those connections. And what's going to happen is 
with this connection, it's going to wire them in so it affects the connections. They could have many types of networks. They could have a family network that's different from a friend network, different from a collegial network, different from a needle sharing network, different from a social media network. Um, but uh, by default, there's one called connections. It's in every agent, including confusingly in Maine. If you, if you scroll up, even Maine has one, uh, which is a bit confusing. But in person, there's a connections. And we're gonna go to connections in person. Yeah. Mm, go to connections. And we're going to go and we're going to say, within connections, we're gonna go down to animation. You may have to, to expand it and say, draw a line connecting agents. Okay, and, and there we go. So I'll, I'll walk through the steps again in case anyone missed it, because I went quickly, living light on the land. So I went to Maine. I scrolled down in Maine. Um, it's going to affect all the populations in Maine. Scroll down. I set network type. This is in the space and network section. It's possible you have to expand it in the so-called accordion. Then boom. Um, space and networks. I set it to be network type, distance based, connection range 75. Good. And then I went to person. I want to adjust the appearance of the person. The, the, the network type is something that applies across many, many people. But here it's a characteristic of a person. So I go on connections and I scroll down there to this area called animation within the connections. And I set it to draw a line connecting agents. There we go. But, um, and it says draw it on top or behind. I don't really care that much, but draw a line connecting agents. And sure, use a black line. Okay, so let's let's go run this model. Let's go build it and make sure it's a happy camper and happy it is. And I'm going to say run. And there we go. And there's our there's our network, ladies and gentlemen. We have a network. Ladies and gentlemen, um, we have ignition. Um, so um with our network, we're going to be able to have agents communicate. We're going to have agents communicate disease, amongst other things. Um, so we've imposed a network. It's distance-based. Two people are going to be connected, if and only if. They lie within 75 distance, uh, 75 units of distance of each other. Um, that was the rule we gave within that area. But time runs on, and let's finish the thought. Um, so now we we have a mechanism for agents to to communicate with each other but um let's go um we have we have to have something that they need to communicate and right now we all we have is a latent state an exposed state um and uh i'm dividing up my time but maybe what we'll do is we'll uh go back to the agent palette that's this one here, Da Vinci's measure of woman. Um, and we will drag in a state here. Boom. And this will be called uh, infectious. Could call it infective. Um, okay, there we go. Um, and now we drag in a transition. And uh, this is going to be a, a rate transition with a mean time of so this will be called um uh, this will be called uh uh so uh completing latency boom there we go um okay um and this will be a rate with uh, a rate of 0.1 there we go we're applying that learning because i'm going to go change this one this transition from susceptible to exposed how does that have to differ right now it's just based on this rate and same exact right sort of situation how does this have to change if we want this to be an honest to goodness communicable disease model how does this have to change what sort of transition should it be or what should trigger this speaking intuitively what should trigger it what would make them um, get infected? Anyone? 
what would make them get infected and thereby proceed to the infectious state? Somehow I lost the connection. Um, anyone want to say? Oh, my phone just died. Okay. Um, anyone want to say what would lead them to go from here to here? Anyone? Um, maybe you could speak out because unfortunately I can't with the phone dead. I can't see the chat. Um, if they are connected, they're well, connected. well, they're connected, but what leads them to be infection to be transmitted is more than connection. It's a, one of the people being infectious, infectious, and therefore exposing the others. So we need a way for them to communicate like, hey, you're exposed uh, to infection, okay? Um, so here we're gonna go. Um, how are we gonna do this? Um, well, we're going to have them transition here. Uh, and this is going to be what's called, instead of a rate transition, it's going to be a message transition. Mm. A message transition, they're gonna be exposed and boom, um, by virtue of their exposure, they're gonna get, a, a, they're, gonna, they're gonna be infected and proceed to this latent state, state of latent infection, which traditionally somewhat confusing is called exposure, exposed. Okay, they are exposed, but they're infected, okay. Um, so that's great. Um, this will allow someone to, to get exposed. Then we're gonna have this infectious state, but if we run this, nobody's gonna get infectious because there's nobody to infect them. So we need the infectious people to do something, to like expose other people. So let's go do that. Here in the palette, let's go drag in a transition to infectious. And I'm going to drag that in and it's gonna go from infectious and it's gonna go to infectious here. Boom. I'm gonna go back to it. Mm. Mm. Okay. Um, they're not gonna leave infectiousness by exposing others but this is gonna go off periodically, maybe with a rate of, of one per day for each of those, um, each of the days that they're, they're infected. Um, and each time it goes off, we're gonna send a message to their connections. So this, that's them. We're saying, hey, they're gonna send a message. Send to, and we're gonna to send to random connected, sorry, send to random connected a message. You could see it tells you, hey, sends a message to a randomly chosen connected agent. That's to one of their connections. While they're infectious, they're gonna expose the people around them. Okay, there we are, boom. Send to random connection and it's gonna send the message Exposed exclamation point. Right now, it's not going to matter what this, the message is. Next time, we may see multiple types of messages. Um, maybe some are pro social connections, which encourage mask use, where mask use or, or vaccination. Maybe some are messages that are exposure. Um, but um, uh, here we're sending a random person to them that are connected the exposed message. These are double quotes here on both sides of it. Okay. Um, great. And so when, when an infectious person is here, they're going to send these messages to people around them. And those agents around them, if they're in the susceptible state and they receive such a message, they'll go to the exposed state. That's the idea. Okay. Um, that's the idea. Um, Maybe just to complete the thought here, we will go put in a recovered state and we'll put in a transition from infectious to recovered, which again, maybe it'll be a, 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 a timeout transition with a mean time of 14 days. 14 days, they remain exactly in the infectious state. And then maybe they wane in terms of immunity all the way back to this, uh, to this susceptible state. How did I do that? I went and I dragged in this transition. 
and I connect it to recovered and put it back to susceptible. I'm going to double click on this and make it less um, um, offensive and, and visually. Um, so I'm going to make it like that. And this is going to be called waning of immunity. Mm. And it's going to occur at a rate of 1.0. I, I hate to put these numbers directly in here, but 1.0 divided by 365. So 365. Yeah, sure. Um, sure. Um, okay. Um, so mean time of one year um, in this state. This, uh, you can in any logic say show name, and then it shows the nice name of this. Here you can say show name, and it will be, um, I'll call this recovery. Uh, that'll be kind of nice. This one, sure, let's show the name. It'll be completing latency. And this one, uh, we should call it infection, and it should um, show the name, okay? Um, maybe I'll call it exposure, exposure. It is infection, but later we'll, probably next time we'll elaborate it so there's only a probability of getting exposed. Okay, there we go. Um, but we haven't done anything. Remember, we only have two colors right now. Color for this, green, a color for this, yellow. We need to set colors for these just for completeness. So here, for this one, for the entry actions, I'll set it to color equals red. We're gonna set this variable color to be red. It's a colon here. Semicolon. Semicolon. It's a colon. Um there, there we go. Oh, sorry. There we go. Color equals red. That's that's for the so-called entry action. When they enter in here, it'll it'll put that down. And when they enter recovered, we'll put down that they will be um, black. Okay, black. Mm. So they come in here, they'd be green. And when they proceed here, they'd be yellow. When they proceed here, they'd be red outside the border. And here they'll be black. Great. Okay, so we have infectious people. They can spread infection. We have people, if they are exposed, while they're susceptible, they can get infected and go to exposed. We're almost done. But if we run this model, we'll find it singularly unexciting in terms of infection spread. Why not? Why, why is it unexciting? Why isn't there something interesting happening in terms of infection spread? Anyone? What are we missing? We're missing a single important item at the start of the infection. What is it? They have the ability for infectious people to infect others. Once exposed, the susceptible can get infected. Um, these ones around green indicates everyone's susceptible. They're all waiting for an infection. What are we missing? I, I, I'm hoping that maybe there's an answer in the chat. We're missing network has no effect. Well, this, the network can actually send messages to each other, but we're missing one key item, one index item. What is it? Uh, probability of uh, Well, uh, it's true that we could add a probability, but right now they're certain to get it. If they're exposed, they're going to get infected. So it's kind of probably one, but we're still missing one key thing. One key element. I'll give you a hint. There was it, was it was an element of COVID nineteen that was not present in twenty eighteen and twenty seventeen and twenty sixteen and twenty fifteen um, in North America in twenty fourteen. There's nobody at the start infected. There's nobody here is infected right now, and so there's nobody to start the infection. It's all ripe for infection if there's only a single index individual. There's nobody. So let's go add that index individual, okay? 
Now we can do it in two ways. We can click on something and add them. I'm just gonna send it to a random person when the model starts up. I'm gonna send the message to a random person. So how are we gonna do that? Go to main, let's go down main. I can double click on this to get to it or you can click it here. And I'm gonna call in another element of the vocabulary called an event. And this is gonna be called the initial infection event. And this is gonna occur. Zeus-like, like there's going to be this event, boom, um, and it's going to uh, to infect people. Okay, so it's this zinger. It goes off at a certain time. Initial infection will be event. It'll be at occurrence time zero days, and it'll be occurring a single time um, uh, here, and that's indicated with this thing. Occurs once. Uh, great, and its job in life is to do something. And this is what it's going to do. I'm sorry. This dot deliver to random agent inside. So that's what we want. I'm sorry. I was I was thinking it was send, but it's deliver to random agent inside. Let me go put that into the window here. There it is. And remember, you can always get it to auto complete here. How did I do that? I do this dot deliver and on. You see, I do control space, deliver to random agent inside, and I press enter, and it, it fills this out, and, and then I put in this expose. Thing. So apologies. Um, there it is right there. Deliver to random agent inside. I'll put it in the chat if you want to see it more closely. Great. Okay, so we're delivering it to a random agent inside um inside main um and let's go run it here run and um we should have a single person who starts exposed that was the person that was um that was initially infected so it got it started someone else exposed now you could see they changed and now they change from yellow to red. And by virtue of changing yellow to red, they are now infectious. That's what redness indicates. And by virtue of being infectious, they are exposing other people. That's what this is showing. They're exposing people around them. And while they're infectious, they are sending every one time unit on average, that's a rate transition, it's firing. They're extending to a random connection in the network the exposed message and the infection is spreading to their neighbors. And each of those neighbors, if they were susceptible, will now get exposed and in the fullness of time become infected and start passing on the gift that keeps on giving. And um, here you'll see it moving around the network until there are a lot of uh, a lot of recovered and it's more or less died out. Um, You'll notice that this infection uh, can lose immunity. Um, and in the fullness of time, you'll notice that these infected people or these recovered people will go back to a susceptible state. But you'll notice the infection has died out in this model by that point. It's disappeared. This is a discrete model. Infection is quantized. The count of people infected at any one time is quantized. So it's died out. In a compartmental model, it would not die out. It would Go down to very very little levels maybe a 0.1 person or 0 .001, 0 0.001 person or 0 0.001 person but it would stick around and as more susceptibles accumulate it would take off again here it's quantized right there's you can only have a minimum of of one person in fact that below that it's zero it dies out now of course we're at a much larger population as we saw fit to add at the very get-go in one of your first little exercises, we could run this. And what we will see is, oh, sorry, um, um, a spread of infection across the network there. Um, and it leads to these little pockets of infection. And an interesting question is, will it persist now? And persist, it seems to, uh, at least at a localized level. Um, uh, for now, it's sticking around 
because there's a large enough population to allow it to proceed in nooks and crannies. And, uh, you know, we could look at some of the dynamics of this later, but it's propagating and sort of knocking around the network. And over time, more people are becoming susceptible again because of waning of immunity and they're getting exposed and the infection is not entirely dying out in this population of, of a thousand. Now, if we were to run this forward, um, it is of course possible being a stochastic model that at some point by luck of the draw and the particular arrangement, the geometry or the topology where, you know, you have the, the infection is blockaded in a certain area and can't get out, it is possible that it will eventually die out. And I suspect if I were to run this for a day or two, we, there's a good chance it might stochastically die out at some point. And from then on, uh, infection wouldn't be around any more than smallpox is around now in the world. It will have been kind of eradicated by, um, uh, by sheer uh, statistical coincidence. But, um, you know, this is a smaller model um, that is capturing some of these quantized effects, yet nonetheless it persists due to the large number of people, the density of connections, the different ways it can spread, uh, et cetera. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, we talked about agent-based modeling. We talked about agent-based modeling having characteristics of um, having populations, one or more populations, um, each composed of individual agents. Um, and those individual agents having the um, um, having characteristics uh, such as sex uh, parameters um, and evolving state um, such as characterized by the state chart. Um, there are actions for changing that state over time, such as these transitions. There are rules for evolving the state. We saw three of them, a timeout transition, a rate transition, and a message transition, indicating an asynchronous connection. I expose you at a time you didn't expect. You know, it came in like a bolt of lightning, boom, you're exposed. Um, um, we saw that these agents have means of interactions with other agents. We saw that in the form of none other than the network uh, in which they are ensconced. But we also saw it in terms of their location to which the, the net, from which the network follows, connecting people who are, who are staying within a certain distance of each other. The model's a certain time horizon and characteristics. Um, if you go look here, you'll, you'll find that um, in the simulation, this will run for a certain amount of time. Here it's 100 days, um, for example, or actually this time, excuse me, it's never. It just runs and runs and runs um, uh, and, and does not stop. Uh, we also saw that uh, we have uh, some initial state and we saw some defining characteristics such as the presence of stochastics. Um, I shouldn't say defining characteristics, but prominent characteristics in agent-based modeling such as the presence of stochastics, which um, can uh, lead to small effects, like chances of exactly when someone will be exposed, but to large effects as well, such as infection, extinction, or sticking around. All of those, all of those leads and gentlemen are aspects of agent-based model. So this is a, a first little uh, exposure to agent-based modeling. Um, some of the concepts of agent-based modeling, some of the practice of agent-based modeling for communicable disease. Um, I hope that's uh, been useful in situating you. I think we will have a second such tutorial whereby I expose you to uh, some additional uh, subtleties and, and, and components here. Um, but I'll, I'll consider that in light of my schedule here. Um, I also have thousands of videos, um, literally, probably 1,500 to 2,500 on agent-based modeling and, and hybrids, um, uh, predominantly uh, in this platform, which you can, um, of which you can also partake. 
Um, but I hope that's useful to, to get you uh, exposed to some of the issues there. Um, and for those uh, interested in weaving this into projects or into your um, um, into research plans, hopefully this exposed you to some some basics. Um, I'm always glad to to answer questions in general. Uh, I will have to ask though uh, for your uh, uh, for your pardon tonight. Um, normally I'd like to dialogue, but uh, the hour grows late for me, likely for you. And uh, I had just found out not long before this tutorial that I have a grievous amount of work to deliver on by tomorrow morning after this tutorial, and I need to marshal my energy. Um, so I hope you'll understand it if I uh, retire my sore throat and and uh, we leave a discussion of this to office hours um, on Friday or to uh, subsequent sessions. Um, but uh, hopefully that's useful and I'll look forward to engaging you uh, with you around uh, around this and uh, uh, data science uh, and system science models used jointly um, in coming lectures. So thanks so much. Hopefully it's useful. Take care of them.